I am, I guess, what the world would call a philosopher. But let me tell you, that's not, that's not much because everybody is a philosopher. Everybody. Each one of them. Because the philosophy is the way you live. Your, your philosophy. Because you live from what you think. You do what you think. And you live out from such a position. So this makes everyone a philosopher. Well, now, in order to make myself clear, and if you will excuse me for talking about me, but those that have read my work know that I say that the only philosophy any of us can really know is our own, and if we can learn our own and know it, and know we know it, and live it honestly, then that's a pretty good head start. Uh, you've heard echoes of this from your religious training, I'm certain, and from your moral training. So this philosophy, then, that I am writing about is my own, just my own. Because that's the only one that I can write about with any degree of authority. It's the only one I can really be honest with. But I know what I have found out for myself. And I know I know what I have found out for myself, and that's all I talk about. And of course, each of us only knows what each of us finds out for, for himself, herself. Now let me, let me uh, just give you a little background. I began a quest for truth for myself. I don't know why. I just decided I wanted to know what truth was, what reality was, is. So I began to study. And when I got into college, I decided to major in religion to find out. But I be only became confused because everybody said his way was the only way. And then World War II came along, and lo and behold, I had the great fortune to go to India. And in India, this is a country shot full of different religious beliefs, but none of them that I was familiar with at all, so I had a chance to study all of the Indian religions. And then I went into Burma, had a chance to study the Burmese religions, including uh, uh, some believed in lopping off people's heads and shrinking them and so forth. Then I went into China. And while I was in China, I became acquainted with Oriental philosophy. And also, while I was in China, I had the privilege of meeting uh, a man who was a most remarkable religious man. He was at what is called a Taoist. T-A-O-I-S-T, a Taoist. Taoism is one of the major religions of the world. And I have studied with him for a very long time. Then I came back and uh, began putting my concepts all together. I went back to college. And I began to put my philosophies together. And, and, and all of this time, I had been being molded, you see, by all of the different influences. and. Uh, so it seemed to me that throughout all of the religions of the world, I saw that there was a point, many points of agreement. And I decided, well, I would like to write a book, if I could, where I would point out not where all the religions differed one from another, but where they all agreed with one another. Because if we could find a single point of agreement that all of the religions across the face of the earth agree on, then we could say, aha, we're getting close to truth. Because all of them agree at least on this point, or this point, or some other point. So I began writing, man. So I wrote for a few years, and then the Korean, I was a soldier this time. But I was writing at every turn of the road. All my spare time was spent in research and writing traveling all over the place from teacher to teacher. Anybody that professed to know a truth, that's where I went. Now, I've got to tell you this. You have all seen the young people that travel all over the country. 
They are commonly referred to as hippies or something. But most of them are very beautiful folks, just like you. And uh, most of them are earnest and honest and genuine and sincere and are earnestly about the business of looking for the truth. Just recently, I was riding down a road in California, and uh, I had room for one in my car, and I picked up a young man, and he got in the car, and the first thing I said was, what you looking for, man? And he looked at me, and he said, reality. And I thought that was a pretty darn good answer, and I waited a few minutes, and I said to him, what did you say you were looking for? And he said, identity. So between the two of us, we struck up a great friendship. How many of you think that reality and identity might be reasonably close together? Stop and think about it just a minute. Reality, what we call reality, what's real as opposed to what's fiction, what's illusion, and identity. Identity. You know, everybody says, I want to know who I am, and why I am, and where I am, and what's the purpose of life, and what's cooking. And so how many of you would think that perhaps there might be a relationship between this young man's reply to me, he said, I'm looking for reality, and then later he said, I'm looking for identity. Do you think there might be some relationship? Well, there he is. How many of you would like to know what your identity really is? Do you think that it's a, a, a sack of skin full of bones and, and vessels and pumps and water and so forth? Do you think that's your identity? Or do you think that identity might be greater than that? Do you think it might also be include a thing called consciousness and life and love? Well, I know. I know all of you know the answer. You know that identity isn't that thing you see when you look in the mirror. It's infinitely more than that. All right, well, what about reality? If you look down a railroad track and you see these tracks coming together, well, you know, because you're, you know. You have the intellectual knowledge to know that those tracks don't really come together. And so, you see what appears to be an illusion of the tracks coming together, but reality is, or that is your knowledge, your intellectual knowledge allows you to know that that is an illusion, that it doesn't really, they don't really come together, that they're parallel, and parallel lines don't meet in the distance, even though they appear to. Or you stick a stick down in a glass of water and it looks like it's bent, and you know that it isn't really. So. You can see that there is such a thing as illusion at all turns of the road. Everywhere we look, we see what we have been calling reality, but it may not necessarily be so real. In the same way, we've been looking in the mirror maybe and thinking that that was all there was to identity, but then as we get older, we find out that identity is more than that form. So therefore, reality was not necessarily your former view of your own identity, right? Well, now let me let me go back and tell you that what happened. I, I was here. I am. I'm in China, and I'm a young second lieutenant of infantry. And we're getting ready to go out in the field and get in combat. And so being an infantryman, you know, your physical conditioning and your ability to get up and down the hills, all that means a lot. But we were to be assigned an interpreter so that we could communicate with the Chinese troops that we were going to be with. You know, a man that can speak English and he would interpret for you. Well, since I was the junior officer, that is the youngest one, I had the last pick. Everybody else had the first pick. I had the last pick. 
And so everybody else got the young officers, the young, the young interpreters that could keep up with them, getting up and down the mountains, and all that was left was a little old cherub of a man. I thought then that he was elderly, but he really wasn't, I suppose. He was about my age. But then I thought he was pretty old brother, you know, he'd be going up and down the mountains. And he was short, and he was fat, and he uh, had a perpetual smile on his face, and he looked like a cherub. He looked just exactly like it. Everywhere he went, he was laughing, and he was happy. Everywhere he went, people talked to him, and the kids ran up to him. And he's the one I got stuck with. The only thing was, he could really, he was really good with his English. He had worked with the English down in Hong Kong. And so, he knew his Chinese very well, and he knew his English very well. Well, he had been with me for about 10 days, and I had decided that I was going to shape up this old man, get him in physical conditioning, and going to, since everybody loved him, and everywhere he went, everybody was talking to him, I thought, gosh, not only do I have an old man, but I've got a socialite besides. So I'm going to break him with that. And so I put him on a program of physical conditioning, doing push-ups and all that kind of business. But I still couldn't keep the people from coming around talking to him all the time. And uh, I noticed that everybody seemed to be, they seemed to enjoy his presence in his company. Well, 10 days or thereabouts had gone by when, when I, the word came to me that his just, just two weeks before I met him, his wife and his daughter had been killed. Just two weeks before I met him. His wife and daughter had been killed in Hong Kong when the Japanese invaded Hong Kong. They had been brutally killed right before his eyes. His wife had been raped to death right before his eyes. And his daughter, a young lady. And yet here was this man, less than a month later, all smiling, happy. Everywhere he went, he was light and sunshine. So I, being the one uh, about the business of trying to determine what truth is and what reality is, and I wanted to know a secret. I wanted to know how he could be tranquil, so tranquil and so happy under those circumstances. Now, I want to tell you that this man, I didn't know it at that time, but this man was a venerated teacher over in, in China, a Taoist teacher. Then people would come from all over China and all over India to go and study with him. I remember I called him into my tent one evening and I asked him if this story I'd heard about his wife being raped to death and his daughter, if, if this was true. And he said, yes. And then I said to him, I said, well, I'm very sorry about that. And of course, I, I sympathize with you. But I don't understand you Orientals and your tremendous disregard for life. How can you be so callous? as to show no remorse or something or feeling for your wife and daughter. And he said, well, he said, I've learned a little bit about you during these past 10 days, too. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, I understand that you are looking for reality, for identity, and that you have studied a lot of different religion to include the, the mystical religions, oriental religions, and so forth and so on. And I said, yes, that's right. And he said, don't all of the religions on the face of the earth agree that death is not real? Doesn't Christianity say that death is not real? 
But it is an enemy to be destroyed or to be understood? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I believe that too. And it's because I believe it and am living what I believe rather than just professing what I believe that you see what appears to be a man who's not disturbed about the appearance of death. So I said, hot dog, I'm going to learn this man's secret. And I learned some of his secrets. But I tell you that already, I tell all of you, all of you right here, Every one of you. All of you already know all of these secrets. You already know them. They're deep within you. Just waiting for you to find it. But I'm just saying that ultimately you're going to find the real secrets, the honest secrets, the real answers come forth from within yourself. And the honest books, the good books that you read, will verify the truth that you already know deep down within yourself. Let me tell you another, for instance, with this man, this teacher that I studied, that I studied with. We were being pursued by a Japanese patrol. And it appeared that our lives were just about to be lost. And here I am saddled with this elderly man, and uh, there was nothing between the pursuing Japanese and us except just a little bit of space. And well, I was trying to increase it, and but because of the, this this old man and his inability to climb these mountains, that we the Japanese were catching up to us in a hurry, and. It, we were rushing back to the to the safety behind the Chinese lines. The Chinese were at that time on our side, you know, back during World War II. And so we were trying to get back behind the Chinese lines to safety. And so there was a big mountain in front of us. And we climbed that mountain. And I knew that I thought the Chinese were on the other side of that mountain. Well, we climbed that mountain. And I'm continually nagging at old Mr. Schuer. That's what I call him, this teacher, Mr. Schuer because I was sure he could give me the answers that I was looking for. All the answers about life and reality and truth. So Mr. Schur, I kept nagging him to hurry up and get up the mountain and to come on. And by the time we got to the top of the mountain, he was so tired that he was sick. And he, you know, you get how you get the heaves when you get very, very tired. And, Here's this old man with the dry heaves, and, and to have the dry heaves is an awful mess, isn't it? Any of you, any of you that have had them, when you're throwing up and there's nothing to throw up, and yet you keep trying, and here he is, and he couldn't move. He was so tired and so sick, but yet there we were on top of the mountain, you know, and we figured that we could run down to the Chinese lines, but what, what do you suppose when we got up there? No Chinese lines down below, just another big mountain, bigger than the one we were on. And so here is this awful sight of another mountain, worse, being pursued by an oncoming Japanese group. The old man knew that I was thinking that, that if I were captured, I would certainly be killed, but because, because there was no question but what I was a soldier, but he could at least disguise himself as a peasant, and maybe he could survive, and so he knew I was thinking about leaving him, just, just leaving him. And so he was faced with all of that, the inability to climb another mountain, death, right, knocking, knocking, tapping on his shoulder, and the possibility of, of me just leaving him, because I honestly was considering leaving him. So here he is, and besides that, he's sick as a dog, and he's throwing up, and he's lying there on the ground, and I knelt down beside him, and I was just getting ready to tell him, well, Mr. Sure, I'm going to go on, because you can disguise yourself as a peasant, and maybe you'll survive, but you know they'll know me, because I don't look like an Oriental. So, I kneel down beside him to tell him that, and he points, and he says, look at the mountain over there, and I said, yeah, I see the damn thing, we've got to climb it. 
We've got to go over it. I see it. Don't worry. I see it. He says, look, though, look, closely. He said, look at that small crevice over there. And so I looked, and it was just almost big enough to have snow on top of it. It was above timberline, but it didn't have snow on it. But he says, look in the crevice up there between those two peaks, and look down in the shadow, and look closer. Tell me what you see. And so I looked, and I said, I don't see anything but a big mountain to climb. Let's go, man. Let's go. He says, look, look. There's a purple flower that's just beginning to bloom up there. It's one of the most beautiful mountain flowers you've ever seen. So, what do you think of a man who, in the face of, of such a thing as that, looks out and sees beauty instead of death? Instead of being frightened and upset and disturbed, he still sees beauty out there. So, you know, I didn't leave him. How can you leave somebody like that? Well, many years went by. I told you how we met. Now I'm going to tell you how we parted. Well, the Taoist tradition is that you go and you see the so-called master. Master, I use that to put it in quotes because there really is no master. The dominion lies, of course, with yourself, with you, and not with anybody else. So his, the tradition with the Taoist is you only see him once each 28 days. You go and you get to visit with him for a few hours once in 28 days. And during that, during that few hours, he tells you what to do for the next 28 days. And here I am on the other side of the earth, a long ways from home. And uh, so you can see that by 28th day, I got to, it got to where it was pretty important to me to see this fellow. And I look forward to it. And so... The 28th day rolled around, and I had been anticipating being there and had done everything he had told me to do for the preceding 28 days. And as I say, this had been going on for four years. And, and I was growing pretty proud of all of my accomplishments, you know. I thought I was pretty smart because I knew an awful lot that, that nobody else knew about religion. I thought, and I was very proud of myself. Well... Here it was, the 28th day, and I was to see this man, and I was really looking forward to it because he had become sort of like my father to me. Here was the 28th day, and I went in, and, he, and I thought he loved me. In fact, I was sure he loved me because we had struck up a great camaraderie. During the war, I had saved his life on an occasion, and he had saved mine. Okay, so here it was, and we'd meet face to face in this little room, and this is the Taoist custom. You greet one another with a bow, and I bowed, and he, he bowed, but I noticed he looked real funny. He looked different, and he, he gave me a very stiff bow. Then, as is the tradition, the Taoist takes one step toward you, and then you're entitled to then take a step toward him. And so he gives me this cold stare and refuses to take the step toward me, and I wondered, what have I done wrong? And then he puffed himself up like a big toad, and he looked at me, and never a crossword had ever passed between us, but he, he looked at me and he said, you fool. And I was... I was dumbfounded. And then, like he, like I hadn't heard it very well, he looks at me and he says it again. He said, you fool. And then he turned around on his little slippered feet and out he went. And I was, I was just flat dumbfounded. I just couldn't, I couldn't make it. I didn't know what I'd done wrong. And I started thinking real quick what he had given me to do, and I'd done it. And all these years, I'd done it. He'd given me all kinds of things to do, and I'd done it faithfully, because the only way you learn is to learn. And you do what others have done that has worked. And I'd done it. I'd done it. Everything he told me would teach me something. But yet he called me a fool, and out he went. And so I was hurt. First, I was hurt often. Well, now, I was living in his stable. 
And I went back to the, my quarters down there, and by the time I got there, I had gone through my mind everything that I had done and decided that I hadn't done anything wrong. And I had, that he was unjustified to call me a fool. So first my hurt turned, then it, it be, became real anger. It went, it went from bewilderment to hurt to anger. And then I decided I had been unjustly treated. I decided that I was not a fool. And I packed my duds and I left. And I went back, this is the way the kids travel now, via the grapevine where anybody would take care of me. And I got back to India, and when I got into India, I met a couple, an Indian couple who were on their way to go and study with this man. And I said, uh uh, don't waste your time. He's a false prophet. He talks about love, but he doesn't practice it. He doesn't live it. He talks about it, but he doesn't live it. He preaches it and professes it. But he doesn't live it because he broke my heart. He tore me up. He called me a fool. And, and so I stopped these people from going, I guess. Okay, now, I finally got home. And I was greeted by my father. I would have had great reservations about coming home because I didn't think that maybe I would be so welcome around home after all I'd done. <coughs> Well, anyway, so after the greeting from my dad, he says, hey, Bill, you've got a letter from China. And I went to open the letter. I saw the postmark, and it was from Mr. Shure, this man. And I opened it up, and while I can't tell you exactly what it said, I can tell you approximately what it said, because it's burned <laughs> like a tattoo. Here's what it said. It said, Dear Bill, whom I love very much, he said, This day I'm going to do the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. He said, This day I'm going to let, let you see and meet face to face well, the only thing that stands between you and a recognition of the identity that you want to find so bad. This day, I'm going to introduce you to the only barrier that stands between you and a recognition of the real identity, truth itself. He said, this day I'm going to introduce you to something that is so nasty and so insidious and so vile and so filthy that it will allow two words to end the friendship of many moons. He said, this day I'm going to let you meet your ego face to face. I had to stop and think. He had only said two words to me. He had said, you fool. You fool. Well, what's that? Those are just two words, right? You turn on television, you hear people say, you fool all the time. Do you take it personally? Who makes the determination that those words are good or bad? You just said, you fool. What is it that gets mad if it isn't an ego? What is it that feels hurt if it isn't an ego? What is it that, uh, that feels that it has to defend itself if it isn't the ego? So, I realize that this man, who did love me, he loved me very much, enough to teach me a lesson in the only way that a dunderhead like me could learn. So I, I, I immediately sat down and I wrote him a letter. 
And that letter came back to me, Martin, deceased. So you see, what he did for me killed him because he did love me. And he did bring them face to face with that thing called ego, big fat ego, that we all contend with. I have someone who was willing to lay down his life for me. Then I remembered the words of that Nazarene, the man called Jesus, the Christ, who made the statement that the greatest of all gifts is the willingness to lay down your life for someone else. Okay, so here was a man then who had done this thing for me, willingly. And since that day, ladies, men here, I tell you that I have known what ego is, and the insidiousness of it, and the nastiness of it, and I know all that stands between us and our recognition of what truth really is, what love really is. What companionship and friendship and home really is. The only thing that stands between us and the knowledge of it is a thing called ego, and that it's up to us to recognize what it is, to root it out, and have done with it. And this is what I write about. This is all I write about. Once upon a time in your life, you were taught the, the, the alphabet. Okay, so a teacher was in the front of the room and teaches you the alphabet. But where did the recognition take place within yourself? Where did you really learn it and know it and feel it within yourself? When did you say to yourself, aha, I know it within yourself? There's an old saying in the East, I can point to the moon and can show you where it is, but you have to see it with your own eyes. Jesus made the remark, the kingdom of heaven is within you. So reality has to be somewhere beside out there. Where do you suppose it is? It's within yourself. And you don't worry about it being inside of everybody else. It's within yourself. And you discover it there first. You quit worrying about what the other people do, whether they agree or disagree, like it or don't like it. You find it within yourself. And live. But I tell you what, I got into India once and I, went to, I wanted to study with a teacher and, and this teacher found out how much money I had in the wallet. And that's what it was his fee. It took every penny I had. And yet, I managed to go from there on into China. But you'll find yourself with the means. But, uh, of course, that doesn't mean that, that you have to leave home to find the truth. The truth is ever right where one is. I assure you that the truth is right where one is because one always says here, doesn't one? If you were asked, where are you, you would always say, I am here. So here is where the truth is. The truth is always here. One doesn't have to go outside looking for it. It's here, always, within oneself. I used to go around, I call myself looking for God. Where did I find God? Well, I found God was the very life I am, this very life. I had wondered all this time what it was and where it was. It was right where I was, being what I was. Now, would you like to ask some more questions? I wonder if, while you were talking, if you identified with your own personal philosophy with any American philosopher. No. And you found something helpful. In American yes, indeed, indeed. I think I must I must say that I have come to find out that there's beauty in every religion and every philosophy, and I have found out that I include them all. 
within the identity I am. And, and, and uh, consequently, I look on all philosophy like I would look on a big flower garden, and every religious belief, whether it's Eastern, Western, Mid-Eastern, or wherever it comes from, even African voodooism or whatever, whatever it might be, is just another flower in my garden. And uh, they're all beautiful, and I include them all within myself. And let me show you why you include them all within yourself. Now listen, because here comes something that can really turn you on. Really. Turn you on the rest of your life. In ways that will carry you to heights that no, nothing else can carry you. Where, whereabouts, whereabouts have you ever heard of any of the religions of the world or any of the philosophies of the world or any of the philosophers? Where? Just stop and think. Where have you ever heard of it? Within your own thinking. Somebody else's thinking? No, within your own thinking. The very one who right now looks up here into the front of the room and sees what appears to be an image up here by the name of Bill Samuel, whose awareness is it? Whose consciousness is it that's doing the looking? It's the consciousness that says, I am. You're on. That's consciousness, isn't it? Okay, now where have you ever seen any sight except within that consciousness? In anybody else's? In the one called mother's? In the one called teachers? In the one called ministers? In the one called philosophers? No. One awareness, your own. The only sights you've ever seen have been your own sights. No matter what sights they were, you've seen them in one place within your own thinking. You now, you sound so lonely. Lonely. Okay, that, does that make you sound lonely? Yeah. Well, the Lord thy God is one God, the statement is. Let me point out that there really is this one awareness, and that's all you're concerned with. Where have you ever heard any sound except within this one awareness? And where have you ever felt any feelings or thought any thoughts except within one awareness, the one you call yourself? And yet you say this would make you lonely? Yeah. Dear lady, it doesn't, because this thing, heretofore you've been looking in a mirror and you've been seeing a very pretty body form there. We say this is identity. Well, imagine what a great awakening it is to recognize an identity that is infinite, that includes all people within itself. Well, you've heard the statement to... Love God with all thy heart and soul, might, and so forth, but, and then to love mankind as yourself. Have you ever heard that? To love everyone as yourself? Well, when you, when, when you awaken to this new identity, to a greater identity, an all-inclusive identity that is infinite and beautiful and pure and perfect, that includes everybody and everything, all of a sudden you can love yourself and everybody and everything because you're looking out at an aspect of yourself. And all of a sudden you can see why to call somebody uh, something ugly or to hurt somebody. All of a sudden you can see why to do such a thing would only be to be calling yourself something ugly or hurting yourself. Now, admittedly, we come up in one sort of a culture and we've got our own hang-ups in, in it and we've got our own prejudices and opinions within it and we have our own jargon, our own terminology within it. I have tried very hard to, to come up with a new terminology and a new jargon and to, to say it in ways that it hasn't been said before so that we could see how silly it is to condemn or criticize or exclude somebody else's ideas and concepts. Do you think parents um, oppress the child searching to a certain extent? The parents oppress children well, searching? Or well, it, it, it would appear that, that I can see everything from parents that 
that oppress their children, and most ridiculously, to those who are ultra helpful. So I see the gamut. I, I can look out at, in, the, in the universe and the objective universe. That is what I see as people, places, and things. I can look out there and see everything. So yes, I see some parents who appear to oppress, and I see some that appear to help. But I think the intentions of parents are always, always good, because parents are very, very prone, you know, to love their own kids. Oh, listen, here's one of the remarkable things. When you awaken to this, this identity as awareness itself, where, after all, the only place you've ever seen the one called mother and father is within this single awareness you are. All of a sudden, you recognize that whoever you talk to, you're talking to yourself, and why can't you talk to yourself as yourself? So then you do. Sure, you can talk to them with absolute equality. Now, this doesn't mean that you're going to hear the reply coming back to you as though they thought this. But here again, the statement is, let's get the beam out of this eye first, and let's live ourselves here perfectly first. And we do it ourselves as we see fit first. We get honest first before we worry about the dishonesty of others. We get straight here first before we worry about the so-called crookedness of our others out there. There's always something behind the, the action that we see. There's always something behind the word that we hear, and it's always love. Love really is the motive power of this universe, and love is behind everything that's taken place, really. And so, so I seem to go above what I saw with the eyes or behind what I saw with the eyes to, to a greater reality. Love. Even if it's love for an ego, and bear in mind that that's where we all start, loving this ego, feeding and fattening a big intellect, trying to get that intellect ahead of everything and everybody else. That's where we all start, only to find out after a while that that there is more to, to life than just the intellect. There's the heart, too. One time I had a lecture, a world famous lecture, tell me, he says, I've got a, something's come over me. All of a sudden I've gotten to where I can't talk anymore. I get up and I'm frightened. Now this is a lecture. He makes his living lecturing. And I... Okay, now, what am I looking at? I'm looking out only at an aspect of myself that I call a lecturer, right? Where, where do I see anyone? Where do you see right now what you call a room full of people except within yourself? So I talked to this man as myself, and I said, well, okay, why don't you, the next time you stand up in front of a room full of people, look out there and see that whole room is just all included within the very consciousness you are. Don't think of yourself as a man standing behind a podium, but see yourself as awareness, as consciousness, as the divine consciousness that life is. And then, with that recognition, you'll know that you're talking to yourself. And you certainly don't have to be frightened about talking to yourself. So you know what he did? He printed up a little gizmo that he put up on the podium with him that said, Tonight, I don't remember exactly how it went, but in effect it said, Tonight, I'm going to give a lecture on thus and so, and I know my subject very well. And I will be talking to myself, and will appreciate what I have to say, and might even, might even applaud myself when it's all over. But in any event, this man is now lecturing around the world. Still. Yes, ma'am. Um, another thing I heard you say several times is like, you're saying like, believe with your heart or feel with your heart. Do you actually believe that the feeling in that your belief is not coming from the heart itself or the divine? <laughs> Thank you, dear. That's a good question. Anyway, the point you're making is a good philosophic point that has been long argued by philosophers. It brings up it brings up an awful lot of very interesting things, but there is a, in philosophy a problem that has is yet to be resolved, at least within philosophic circles. It's the problem called dualism. Basically, to answer your question there, 
It seems that we have an intellect and a heart. For myself, and that's all I can speak of with any authority, I've struck a balance between the two. First, I was purely the intellectual, and I noticed that my pride and arrogance grew in proportion to my intellect. Pretty soon I thought I was pretty cotton picking smart, and, and I vaunted myself up, only to be brought very low. I ignored the heart because I said the heart isn't very scientific and there's no way to measure it. Well, stop and ask yourself, is there any way to measure infinity? Is there any way that one can measure reality or God? If, if you can measure infinity, it isn't infinite. Okay, so it finally resolved itself that one day I awakened to discover the heart. I awakened to a feeling within myself of great joy, great light, an experience that has been referred to philosophically as illumination. It's been spoken of as the Holy Ghost. It's been spoken of depending on what, where you, what your upbringing has been or what philosophy you're acquainted with. But there is a grand experience, and it happens to everybody, and it's already happened to all of you at one time or another when all of a sudden you felt some great joy within yourself a real cleansing, beautiful fullness within yourself that let you see the world differently, that let you see your friends differently, that allowed fear and anguish and trepidation and all of those things to kind of just pour, pour out, off and out of your fingers. Okay, this is the discovery of the heart. Now, when we first find the heart, we're prone to want to take the intellect and just heave it right out the window and say, well, gee, all these years I've been being led around by the nose by an intellect. And I would take that, that filthy thing and throw it out, and I'll become again as a child. You know, we've, we've heard it said, lest ye become as children. It's a good teaching, too, I tell you. But at, at first, when we first discover the heart, we want to take the intellect and, and destroy it. Well, okay, this doesn't work either, because the heart, the heart is pretty overwhelming at times. Love, we've heard the statement that love is blind, haven't we? You've heard it. Well, I have, for myself at least, found that there's a real happy balance between the heart and the intellect. It's a center. It's called the narrow way. Buddha called it the center way. The one called the Christ spoke of it as the narrow way. In Judaism, it was spoken of as the secret place or the Shekinah or the Holy of Holies, the center. You remember even in, well, in, in the, the book of Genesis, it speaks of the Garden of Eden, perfection. It says a tree in the midst of the garden, in the center. Well, I found a center between the heart and the intellect. And I run with it. I run with it. No matter what the world says. No matter what propriety says. No matter what society says. To the best of my ability, I run with it. I take my licks. But I run with it. And I found that inevitably it, it's right. It tells it to me like it is. Not necessarily like all of the institutions and books and so forth say it is, but it tells it to me like it is. And I then am my own teacher because the minute I do something wrong, who's first to know it? Me, myself, and I. And all of a sudden I have this little voice behind me saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. If I do anything excessively, I know it because... I've lost my balance. Okay, have I answered your question? There's a balance between the heart and the intellect. The heart is very nebulous. It's very hard to put your finger on. can't be defined. It's like thoughts. How can you define... How can you put... How can I put it into words? If, right now, how can I put the national anthem into words so that you can hear the national anthem and feel all the goose pimples and everything that go along with it. How can I do that? Words just can't do it. 
Take one of your favorite pieces of music right now. You tell me how I can take words. And just by using words. Now, I've got no guitars now, and no drums, and I've got no musical group to help me do this. I've got none but words. You tell me how words can communicate all the sound, the melody, the drums, the feeling that goes along with it. Can't be done, can it? Consequently, the answer is words just aren't where it's at either. Words are not. Well, the words are like fingers. They just point in the direction. And that's why I say the, heart, the words lead us to the heart. We read the words, and all of a sudden the heart within responds. And we find this great joy, this great love, and then we know, then we know. Yes, the words, words are symbols, you know, like tree is a, is a thing, but the word is a symbol, just tree, tree. You hear the word tree, it brings to mind tree, but it may bring to mind an oak tree or a pine tree or some other kind of tree, but the word tree is a symbol of a thing. Beg pardon? Created by who? Words. words are made by people. That's right. Words. Words. The words that we're using right here, right now, are man-made. Consequently, there's nothing eternal or, or infinite about them. But words are man-made. And they're, they're like toothpicks. Each word is measurable, and it's a toothpick. And it brings to mind all kinds of things. And a word one day won't bring to mind what it'll bring the next day. See, and as one grows and as one recognizes who and what, what he is, as one's awareness in, expands and develops and grows apace, that same word means a great deal more. Next, next day. That's why when a minister or a preacher or somebody says, this is the meaning of this verse, you're listening usually to a good bit of gas and hot air because it is only a meaning to that verse. Because a verse or something that is genuine or that, is, that relates to the truth itself must mean something to you on whatever ground you stand on. If you're sad, it means something to you then. Take those beautiful words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Take that. All right. If, if you're broke and you need money real bad, if it's dollars you're considering, that verse means something to you then, doesn't it? But suppose it's you're lonely. Suppose it's a matter of loneliness and you are dying for companionship, it seems. And you hear those words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It means something from that position too, doesn't it? Suppose you happen to be very angry. To hear that verse, the Lord is my shepherd, becomes along as something that soothes and does away with anger. So you see, verses, spiritual verses, religious verses, philosophic verses, anything that relates to the truth, pertains to the truth, it means something to every position you, you stand on. And anybody that says, this is the meaning, okay, it's just somebody saying this is the meaning. You can say to yourself, there are other meanings too. But the meaning that I feel here is I is the one that counts because that's the one I act on, right? When I say I, I mean you. I mean you. Please understand. Okay? Have I answered your question? With too many words. I use too many words, didn't I? It seems that we use words to communicate, but do you know now we're getting we're learning how to communicate other ways. How many of you men you 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 men have ever stood behind your girlfriend when she was mad. Now, she didn't have to say a word, did she? She communicated. Anger communicates. Depths of feeling communicate. There are ways to communicate besides words. Words are just the beginning of communication, just a way to communicate. Listening. I, I tell you, looking out, looking out at the teacher out there and think that that's the only way to acquire wisdom. That's one of the first things you're going to learn is this not so. Sure, you listen to the one out there, but when you recognize that the one out there is only an aspect of yourself, come to tell yourself something and that the real confirmation is within yourself, you're going to find yourself learning twice as fast and twice as much. All of a sudden, it'll be like, like they, they said about Jesus. They said, gee whiz, he never had an education. How is it he knows so much? 
to know thyself. Jesus made the remark, know thyself. Jesus made the remark, he said, know what's before your eyes and what's hidden will be revealed. Okay, know then who and what this awareness is. The very awareness that right here, right now, hears these sounds is it, folks. How close to it can you get? Wherever you go, you're just being awareness. You can make your bed in hell, but awareness will be right there. You can flee to the hithermost parts of the universe, but awareness, it'll just be awareness there. So it's already who and what you are. Reality is your very identity right now. Already. And there's no great struggling climb to arrive at what your identity is. There is only to understand what it is. And look for it. And knock. And ask. And I repeat, and we'll conclude, that all you got to do is take one step towards self-discovery. To look deep within yourself to find the life you are, the love you are, the heart you are. And I guarantee you that that self you are will come charging forth to reveal and disclose itself to you. At least so it's been for me. And I can only speak about this experience called I, I, identity, even as you can only speak for the experience that you call I, identity. Folks, I know now that we've gone deep, deep, and this has been kind of, you know, but it's really so simple. This is what I want to conclude. I want to tell you this. i got to tell you this, that reality is so simple. The thing that hides it is its simplicity, not its, not its depth. All these years we thought we've had to struggle and strive and strain to arrive at love and arrive at wisdom, and I tell you, it's closer than breathing, closer than fingers and toes. It's its simplicity. It's simple. It's simple. It's what love is. It's what life is. It's what living is. And you're already it. There's no great struggle to arrive at identity. There's only to admit that there is just one identity to be, the divine identity you are. And then live it to the best of your ability. Begin living out from such a position. And all things really will become new in your affairs. Okay, that's it. I thank all of you for your great attention, and now anybody who wants to ask me anything, I'll hang around for a few minutes. And I do thank you for this opportunity to talk to you very much, and I think it's a wonderful thing you're doing. You're about the business of self-discovery. Thank you.